The other thing is, we're not going to be able to bring in all the food that these people need from outside. Because they live in such a spread out form, they're going to have to grow, um, we calculate about 65% of their food in this zone. And we can't make productive use of that land for, for growing food if we've got all these, all these fences. It blocks too much of the sun. So the fences went, and, and I don't talk about this in Christchurch because you get this, <gasps> <laughs> life without our fences. Oh my gosh. Right. <laughs> the other thing that we have to do is, uh, like I said, we had to move some of the homes that were in this area so that we could get um, some business area and some um, services in here, like medical services and stuff. We, we had a couple of little clinics in this zone, but, but not, um, not a proper medical service. And so the, here's the sort of denser areas. So we have some community areas and um, service areas moved into this zone, some higher density housing in the zone. And um, the other thing we need is integrated communities. This particular zone didn't have any old people in it. Why? Because they're all right over here. We have a huge swath down here of retirement condominium developments. And one thing that you start to learn when you start to figure out how are you going to have a community that lives without oil is you see what oil's done to us. Oil has convinced us that, that people of different economic stature, people of different races, people of different ages are meant to be somewhere else from each other. And that's a bit weird. Nobody's really ever thought that before. Because there's a whole raft of jobs in this zone and everybody has to be able to get to their jobs. And so you can't put all the low income people over there and you can't put all the old people over here. They actually need to be integrated. So whatever these folks are doing, they're taking care of each other apparently. All right, and can you believe I got that picture? <laughs> all right, and the other thing is that the young people in this area have important <coughs> things to do. This is something that, that I've really been struck with um, when I do presentations to high school students, I ask them how many of them think that this society thinks they're important? That there's, there's something, that, that we need them, that they are the most vital part of, of this, you know, of this society. Without them, we'd, what would we do? They don't think that, and I don't think we think that. They're a problem. It may be that we are the first generation to have done that to those age people, 16 to 24 year olds. Those have been the people who have kept us all alive until now. And now because we don't have an agrarian society anymore, they're a problem because they don't have anything to do. And they act like they don't have anything to do. So in this place, they must have something to do. <laughs> Instead of just hang out. All right, the other thing was we went and talked to some um, ecology people and they told us that in order to have microclimate stabilization in this zone, what we needed to do was along every stream boundary we had 20 meters on either side that humans couldn't mess with. It had to be native plantings. And so we have these native corridors that run along the streams and they're connected to other native reserves and native corridors on the hills. So we've had replanting of sloped areas in natives and that keeps the humidity levels constant and keeps the soil moisture moderated and keeps our bird population healthy and um, we can walk along the edges of it but we can't we can't trample it um, the other thing is the local food production we've got all this lovely um, paved area that we can put um, hot houses on so that worked out all right <laughs> <laughs> and then we had to do a lot of replanting. And um, what we couldn't find really good numbers for is the productivity of small-scale gardening. You know, nowadays we know how to, we, we could find <coughs> figures for productivity of hothouses and for farms where you have a, a big area where you're planting strawberries over 15 hectares. And you have, you have um, vehicles that you move up and down and you have pickers and and because that's the way we farm now and we don't really know how much food you can get from from small areas that are scattered about you know does how much more work does it take to actually get food from that and so what we decided was that um, in this place they must actually have master gardeners people who are really good at looking at a space figuring out what would grow there looking at the pest profiles looking at the the moisture and stuff like this 
and they actually go around and make sure that, that, that the land is really productive in this zone because we actually need a lot of food to be produced in this zone because we don't have the transportation energy to bring it in. And so that's the short cycle stuff, the stuff like uh, eggs. And um, we did have to turn one of the soccer fields into, back into a dairy farm. It used to be a dairy farm. So we, we turned it back into a dairy farm so we had, we had milk. So basically it kind of looks like us except um, there's no boy racers, which was kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the streets <laughs> have been really narrowed down um, because you don't need four lanes, right? So, so we've taken it back to um, a two-lane bikeway and, pedest and then a pedestrian area. And it's big enough that the, the electric delivery vehicles and the emergency vehicles can, can zip around. But the other thing is we don't have any children run over, we don't have any pedestrians run over, and we don't have traffic accident deaths and, and injuries in here. So that works out pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, we have the same old things that we do. We have teachers, we have um, people running bakeries, we have trades, we have professions, and we have some new things. We have a lot of microprocessing in this area because we can't, you know, we can't rely on these big farms out on the plains that load up the produce into trucks that goes off to Wadi's in Auckland and then brings it back down to us. Those whole networks are gone and we have to raise food around this area and preserve it and store it there. So the people who are really good at that are doing it. So there's new industries here. Um, there are people who have to keep track of the consumption and, um, and, and material flows for wastes. And if you think about it, we calculated how much land on the Canterbury Plains you would have to plant in rapeseed oil to run the, the waste collection system for, um, for Christchurch. They collect once a week from the curbside. They take it to the Cape Valley, a long ways up from where we are. And we would have to plant more than the, the entire agricultural land of, of the Canterbury Plains to run our current waste collection system on, on rapeseed biofuel. We don't have it, you know, we just don't have it. It's not sustainable. So the waste flows have to be managed here. We have those master gardeners who are appalled if anyone doesn't put the compostable waste where it needs to go. We actually need all that stuff. It has to go back into our, um, into our system. Um, and also our, our consumption system is completely different. Have any of you seen the solid shampoo? There's a, there's a shampoo, now you can get it at Lush that it actually looks like a soap bar. Okay. Yeah, and, and you know, you think about how many shampoo bottles over 10 years you wouldn't generate by using this shampoo bar. I actually used it today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have fixed my hair before I said that. All right. Um, the other thing is that what we do have a lot of flows of is ideas and knowledge. And uh, we actually saw how this would work. Um, it's possible and practical for mechanical engineers to retool, to, to do things um, one-off if they know how to do it. The way we have been working, the project we've been working on for an awfully long time is how do you do more of the same thing with less humans? We could actually turn that around and do it the other way. And then what you would need is that knowledge of how to do things. And now we can communicate with each other all around the world. I could send out a request. I have a request. I need something that lets us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I might get in from someone. I have a proposal for you. OK, let me see it. And I might actually pay them for that idea so that I could do this. You see what I mean? It might be ideas. It might be experience. It might be, oh, we've solved that problem. It might be that kind of thing that travels around instead of the machines or instead of the products. 